Mm-hmm. Um, Recording is on. So there we go. It's official now. I love the I love the echo. The echo made it sound much more profound. <laughs> Recording is on, 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 on. on. <laughs> so how about you? How's your week been? Um, good. I'm just I'm just realizing that I'm overwhelmed by the scale of the problems I'm looking at. So I'm trying yeah. to figure out how to parse them down to you know. Uh, it's the old joke, how do you eat an elephant? And the answer is one bite at a time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, so, and so a piece of this, uh, one question that's active for me that's a little bit too abstract is, uh, where is the fungus? Have you heard me riff on the big fungus? Uh, it, you, it was mentioned last week, but and I think it was mentioned in response to, I was talking about one of the people, one of the crews I was working with last year who were building a thinking tool on solid. And they were called mycelio, and before that, it was called understory. And their metaphor is they are they want to build the, the 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 fungus, the body of the fungus which lives underground, which connects trees together, and there's actually a forest wide communication network. In, yeah. apparently. So that's there, and that's you mentioned the big fungus, but you didn't elaborate on it. So go. Um, cool. So I own. So if you go to thebigfungus.org, you'll find a little baby fledgling website. Uh, the conceit. You've got a is, lot of those. I do. I have. I have many, actually. Um, yeah, I know because I followed a few of the links, and it's like, oh, here's another website built. You know, <laughs> and, and clearly as a as a you know as a starting point, but it's not very very developed yet. Exactly. No? I do that a lot, just as a as a whole a placeholder for an idea. And if anybody wants to come in and edit and jump in, like it's on Google sites, so it's super easy to to build. Yeah. Um, so the conceit is that leaf cutter ants can't digest leaves. So why the hell yeah. are they up in trees cutting off leaf bits? It's because they're feeding a fungus. Mm-hmm. And they have the symbiotic relationship with a fungus. And mm-hmm. they feed the fungus mulched up leaf bits. Uh, they inoculate it with the fungus. And then the fungus metabolizes and feeds them nectar and tasty fungus bits, which keeps so happy fungus, happy hive. Mm. And it, it gets actually even more interesting. They noticed that the, the, the subgenus of ants who were busy tending the fungus had like a white powder on their thorax. And so they took samples of the white powder, looked at that under the microscope. Turns out this is a beneficial bacterium that acts uh, as an antibiotic uh, to keep the fungus safe. It's crazy. Oh, so the, where does, so the, the, the bacterium grows on the ants but mm-hmm. keeps the fungus safe? Okay. Yes. You know, you know who you should talk to is about this is, is my son who's doing a thesis, a master's thesis. He goes in every day to the laboratory and experiments on ants. Oh, seriously? <laughs> yeah, he's seriously, a mic- yeah. He's a mycologist? Uh, no, he's a uh, you know he's doing a biology or biology or a master's degree in in, in biology um, on you know um, living systems. That's fabulous. And he's he's invest investigating um, uh, something called um, oh look I, I can't remember it right now but how the uh, how uh, um, there's epigenetics the epigenetics of yep. of uh, and he's, he's got like twenty hives of ants in the laboratory and he's uh, doing all sorts of experiments. What's his name? Like he's like, oh, you wouldn't, you don't see him online, William Lowry, unless, unless you find his Flickr account because he's an amateur nature photographer. He's got quite some nice photos online. Well, I've but, just, uh, you I know, just he has him to my brain, so he's official. <laughs> okay. Well, now he's, he exists in the biggest, biggest brain in the world. So now that's, that's quite something. He is brain famous, I call that. <laughs> anyway, so tell me more about. I mean, I I did okay. read the big fungus, but you know, I read like there's like literally five paragraphs. So, um, so I'm I'm just using that as a rich metaphor because I feel like I've been at the at the fungus face for 24 years feeding this weird tool called the brain, mm-hmm. and the brain happens to work the way my brain likes to work. But every time I put something in, and this morning I probably already put 10 10 links in my brain from the news fil- you know the news and the info flood. Um, Every time I click something in, it feels like I'm snapping a little puzzle piece into the large sense-making thing that we need, except the brain is a proprietary tool that doesn't play well with others. Uh, There is a thing called team brain, but you're still kind of building just a brain. And partly I'm trying to figure out how to external, how to evert this brain, how how to make it so that it's a public commons good. Yeah, that still looks like the brain for me, but looks like Kumu to someone else, and looks like Rome to you, or whatever, right? No, right, okay. okay. Or or Hub AI, um, and and how might we then each use our favorite tool to curate and improve this shared asset? Well, the thing is that that is exactly what open standards are supposed to allow, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if you like, Activity Pub is an open standard for sharing content socially, um, and 
you know, it defines a, a, a unit of content. And you can view that unit of content using, you know, Mastodon or Friendica or whatever, any, any client which... So that's one of the reasons why I'm, I want to put my hub on, on, on the Fediverse and the activity hub. Because yeah. then, you know, I, I might create these little atomic units of content um, as notes and then eventually build them into blog posts or articles which I publish. Um, but, you know, if I have friends who I, get, I allow access to my notes, you know, you, it, I don't know whether you've seen any uh, the blog post, but there's a, there's a graphic, graphic in there which, which shows what I mean. There's two levels of, um, of social in there. You've got followers who just see what you publish, what comes out to the public end. But you've got friends, which is a mutual two-way relationship, and you allow them to see some of the notes inside your brain, yep. but only ones you select. So you, you can, a note can either be private Friends only or public, essentially. Yep. Um, and you can do that with activity pubs. And it doesn't, for somebody else to be one of your friends, it doesn't mean they have to have a hub. They, they just have to have a, a client on the, that uses an, an, an identity yeah, that, yeah, that, yeah. that you can recognize. Exactly, that that can that can that can process that piece of content, and they can. Huh. So, so th I was talking about this thing I'd read I'd read recently mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, because I posted my blog post to the Fediverse website, um, right. and the guy he shared me something which he wrote, he just early early this year in January. Let me put it in the chat if I can find it in this interface. Here we go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's another long post, but he talks about social knowledge fabric. So when you're talking about big fungus, he's talking about fabric. Huh. So yeah, you yeah. Know, the other metaphor is tapestry or mosaic. Those are also yeah, and we'll metaphors. Have, follow, follow the link and look wow. at the picture. The picture yeah, yeah, is of a beautiful. tapestry. It's a mosaic of tapestry. Yeah. So yeah. um and if you if you read oh. the article, this is the article that I was reading and I was like, yes, yes, yes. But I was reading it on my phone, so I couldn't do very much with it. That's so brilliant. that's when I get back from um, my holiday, I'm away for 10 days. And that's on my to that's on my to-do list is to process that. And I think that you'll find that there's some similar ideas there. So you might want to connect with um, with with him and some of the people in the in that space. That's the the website dedicated to the Fed events, essentially. Absolutely. Um, that's really cool. Um and it's an open standard, Love. so that's the sort of thing to use. And this is all about um, Fediverse and uh, Federated Wiki. I think we mentioned Federated Wiki last. And we last know Fed Wiki, and I'm and and I'm in Portland, so Ward is a neighbor. Right. Um, yeah. So we could easily connect up with Fed Wiki. Um, and I I've got a perpetual problem with Fed Wiki in that I don't really comprehend why it does what it does, how it does it. But I but I but there's a big community there that's doing cool stuff. It's open source. Mm -hmm. Like uh, there's a bunch of really great things around it, yeah, um, yeah. and I could see it easily as a tool that plays nicely in in building this this fungus. And, and so, let me scroll back to the where's the fungus question. My best answer to where's the fungus right now is that if we use the simplest possible uh, file formats like Markdown plus some metadata, then mm -hmm. the fungus is Markdown files living on shared directory somewhere. Yeah, and we yeah. and we reconstitute it constantly into our own visualization tools, but as long as it's in simple formats, we can then enhance what's in the files and you know and share this thing. Yeah, and so yeah. and, and that this is a really rudimentary view of what the fungus might be, and I think I need to learn a lot more about the Fediverse and these other components. And I've looked at IPFS and things like that a bit. Yeah, but when I when I learned about pinning, I was like, ah, God, that sucks. Because Sorry, the, tell me about pinning. What do you? What is pinning? So it, it turns out, are you familiar with how IPFS works? Not very. No, I know what it is, but I haven't dug into it. it because I do. Yeah, yeah. It's basically a peer-to-peer -peer sharded file system that distributes yeah. file bits over everybody's server. The problem is, if you want a file to persist on IPFS, you have to pin it, which means you have to pay a pinning service. Oh, okay. Right. And I'm like. Okay, so every node I'm going to put, every file I'm going to drop into IPFS, I need to pin if I want it to persist. That's a little bit crazy because I have half a million thoughts in my brain. And if no, each no, thought no. is a... If you don't know which a, one is going to be worth pinning, right? You don't, or, you don't know it until you come back and find it later. Bingo. Or, or I might want every node in my brain to persist as long as possible and, you know... Uh, yeah, yeah, that may yeah, be yeah, super yeah. expensive. Anyway, so but that's so, that's the that's the subscription model basically. But as storage, where you know you you got to pay for the service space 
somehow, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, look, if you use uh, another tool that uses um, Markdown is Obsidian, right? Yes, and Obsidian I'm, I'm, is just Markdown files on your hard drive, right? Bingo. Um, and so I I was kicking myself a little bit uh, metaphorically this morning because I ran into a, a, a Hungarian programmer named Zsolt Vishan, uh, who is on his own little journey. He's a big brain fan and then very frustrated that br the brain is proprietary. So using Obsidian and Excaladraw, an open source yeah, know, yeah. drawing plugin, he built a couple other libraries and expanded on Excaladraw to the point where he can emulate the brain in that combo of tools with plugins. And, and his oh, his his like brainy version is the best and is the best sort of um, thing like uh, let me let me share the link for you of him explaining this thing. Here's the brain like graph based navigation in Obsidian. Let me connect it to today's call and then send you a link to it in the chat. Um, he's the closest I've seen to anybody uh, sort of getting this done properly. And um, there we go. And I wanted to invite him to these calls because I think he's a natural. But the thing I was kicking myself for is not immediately just trying to emulate what he's doing. And I, you know, I think that I think that I've seen this video. Okay. I think I think I think isn't he the guy that in, isn't he the guy that invented Excalibur? Excalibur, in fact. I don't know that he's the inventor of Excalibur, but he might be because he's deep in the Excalibur community. Yeah. But I didn't think he was the Excalibur yeah. guy. Uh, he was talking earlier. If if it's the same guy, and he was talking about um, um, what are they called? Argument maps. Uh, uh, argumentation, thinking ma maps. argumentation maps. There's a bunch of yeah, things. I, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, that was. I think you know, that, that should, was should yeah, 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 yeah. Is, yeah. is the inventor of Excalibur. It's the same guy. I haven't I haven't seen his I haven't seen the video you shared because he's got a lot of videos. But yes, yeah. I know this guy. Yeah, you know, Hungarians are very innovative on with innovative digitally. They, they, I have a thought in my brain so called remarkable Hungarians. Tiny, tiny little company. Yeah, it's it's a study. Oh, do you it's, really? It's, Excellent. Yeah. Oh, let me let me share screens with you. Uh, how do I share screen here? Da, yeah, da, sure. da, da. Start stop sharing your screen. Pick this one. Share. Go to my brain so it's not recursively looping. And then go to uh, Remarkable <laughs> Hungarians. I think it's called Remarkable. Yes, it is. Look at that. Remarkable Hungarians. So Imre Lakatos, Carl and Michael Polanyi, Zoltan Kodai, Lajlo Biro. I, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing any of these correctly. Um, Arthur Kessler, Biela Bartok, Gabor Mate. These are all Remarkable Hungarians. And I've got them yeah, under yeah. Magyars in the Hanuk Empire. And I had a couple of I had a couple of Hungarians working for me many years ago, and one of them told he was the one of them was the guy who introduced me to Prezi when it was still in like a beta. Yes, and nobody Prezi's outside cool. of Hungary had really heard of it. Yeah, and it was like I think this is so cool, you know. Yeah. I was just so blown away by it. And um, and he said, you know, we got into a conversation about how how many remarkable Hungarians there are. And he said, I think he, that his theory is that it's to do with the language. Mm -hmm. If you can, if you learn Hungarian with your mother's milk, you are basically being trained to be a computer programmer. Right. Because it's got this logic, which is just perfect for computer programmers. That's hilarious. So, I don't know if that's true or not, but he was a computer programmer. So that was his, that was his belief anyway. Love anyway. that. Um, so, so a piece that I'm leaning into right now is trying to figure out how those of us playing in this pond might share our notes better, more efficiently, yeah, uh, e question. even though we're in different tools. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how to loop in Ev Williams, who is using Mem right now. And Mem is like Rome, only a little yeah, different. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really know yeah. what the Mem, what Mem's native format is or whatever. But I'm like, OK, how can we make it so that we can start sharing notes through the big fungus, wherever and whatever it is, um, as a simple um, exercise proof that this is even a thing that's easy to do. Yeah. I mean, you know Ev Williams? I do. Yeah, okay. Is he still running Medium or has he moved he on? He is. No, that, okay. that's kind of his, uh, that's one of his main sort of concerns right now is, is Medium. Mm. Um, but I, so many years ago, Peter Mirholz, uh blogged about using Pyra, this little website. So I went to Pyra and it was basically kind of like a document management workflowy kind of thing. And I so I pinged the webmaster and I said, who are you guys? 
And I got a note back from Ev saying, hey, nice to see you. Why don't you come on, drop by? And so I went and visited them when they were in a basement flat uh, near the, the train station in San Francisco, okay. uh, the, the Caltrain station. And then I became an advisor to them before they oh. invented Blogger. And so while we were busy... Oh, this is pre-Blogger, right. So okay. while we were strategizing around Pyra, the guy across the, across the room invents Blogger. That eats the company. There's a whole bunch yeah, of yeah, sure. there's a whole bunch of story there. Then I met with I Ev. Then I met with Ev when he when he founded Odeo, which was kind of an incubator. And I, I you know I, I talked with him and a, a guy about a podcasting app that was like ah, okay before podcasting got really hot and cool. Mm. But then but then somebody in Odeo basically invented Twitter, yep. right? And so Twitter eats the company. Uh, so he's he's been down this this march a couple times before. But what's cool, I think is that he's also seen what happens when VCs come in and when the profit motive kind of presses things. And he's, if you think about what he's been doing, he's been trying to reinvent journalism and civil society. Yeah. No, I know, I know, I realize. I mean, Medium has pivoted a number of times trying to make, how do we make money out of this? And exactly. It hasn't pivoted for a while since they brought in the, the paywall and, you know, membership scheme. I was, was a member for a while. And um, I don't know, I don't know how successful it's been, but they haven't changed. So... I mean, they went away. I, mean, I was glad that they moved away from like the whole sponsored content thing. Yeah, that really made my throat. I don't I know. Much, you know? It's, uh, it's really. I'm hard glad to it didn't your... work. But um, I like Medium as a platform. It's, really it, quite, it's hard to find your way to a clean business model these days. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but I think that having a data union of people working together and in the process training in AI, we monetize the AI. Uh, I, I think that's that's the still thing. That, that's the thing I keep coming back to because I'm not going to pay one dollar or even one cent to store a node on IPFS. You know, bingo, bingo. Um, I would like the possibility if I want to set up my own server, I set up my own server. I just download the open source tools. Great. But if I want somebody to set everything up for me, you know, give me the pod, give me the apps, the templates, the Fediverse uh, account, and, and connect it all together, yep. you know, without having to go into the code, which is what 99.5% of people are going to do. Then, you know, I think there's a business model for that. But even then, I think the getting people to pay for that is going to be hard unless you tell them, uh, um, you know, you have six months free. After that, it may be a couple of bucks a month. Yeah. But even then, if you use the tool enough, you may actually be able to, uh, the, the training that you give the AI will actually, might actually pay for every, all of your costs and may even, you may even get some money back. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's an idea, I guess. I think it's worth pursuing and I don't see anybody else doing it. So, so what's, the, what's the simplest possible path to uh, turn, standing one of those up as an example? Well, you know how you were saying earlier how uh, you got to like eat the elephant one bite at a time? Exactly. Well, you know, that's because you're in this, you've got this big brain, you've got all these ideas and you don't know which end, you still have to decide which end did you start at, the trunk, the tail, one of the feet, an ear, you know, you got to you got to have an angle of attack. And I, I had a similar problem many years ago when I was thinking, I've been thinking about these interconnected issues for quite a long time. And I was like, I, I can't, I need a framework for this. And I couldn't really come up with one. So what I did do was I said, well, if I, if I decided to, I wanted to build a product that would give me my, my framework. Yeah. I want to build, actually build something. And then, and then I can look at something and say, that looks interesting, but it's not relevant to my product right now. So I put it aside. And that is the box I put IP, IPFS in. It was I came across it, made a note about it, not directly relevant. So it's not on my, you know. So I did a lot of that for a while, but because I had the, uh, for the framework of does it fit in this product or not, most things I looked at, I went, no, it doesn't. And then it was, oh, this one does. Mm -hmm. Solid, is, Solid is an example of that. I wrote a blog post. Yep. And the, the this crew from, I think they're from Portland as well, somewhere in California, um, they contacted me and it was like, you know, we're doing something in a similar space. We had a lot of similar ideas. and But I hadn't even, I'd heard about Solid, but I didn't think it was relevant. And they showed me that it was relevant. So it's, it's in there now. Yeah. And the same with ActivityPub. I mean, it started as what you see, myhub.ai is the, the, the website right now, the, the alpha version. That was basically it to start with. And then it just sort of, it allowed me to, it gave me a framework and then I could see what was relevant to it and I could expand the vision. 
and but still leave 90 percent of what i found outside of the framework because it wasn't directly relevant mm -hmm. so that's why i've got this product focus and the the blog post i wrote recently which is the introduction to this chapter is that chapter is now the latest version of my framework i'm going to develop my thinking because i need to deliver a chapter by the end of august to ivo right and that is the only way i can focus and not go down a hundred rabbit holes at once and end up getting nowhere just getting lost underground somewhere because right. i went down 50 different rabbit holes um, you know, it's by turning it into a project and turning it into a product, you know, to right. build something. And um, so I'm going to write my next milestone, big milestone is to write that chapter. And by the end of that, I'll have um, I'll have a, basically a master document for the user requirements. You know, I'll have the features that I want. I'll have, I'll have mock-ups and wireframes and I have a pretty coherent picture of what this product should be. Yeah. And a lot of the stuff in your big brain will sort of not be in it, at least to begin with, but right. that's okay. It's the only way of getting a hands on it. So you eat the elephant one bite at a time. I sort of like, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna take a, fo a product focus yeah. to, to keep me uh, focused on it. Um, a couple things. Um, one of the things I like about the brain is that it has a feature I call local structure, <clears throat> which is, um, it's like websites have local structure. If I click on a link from your website that goes to some of, uh, some third person's website, I'm leaving your local structure, which is how you decided to design your website in whatever sense mm -hmm. you made out of nav menus. And I'm going yeah. to new territory where they might have done something completely different, but over a little period of time, my brain is going to adapt and go, oh, okay, now I understand. Yeah, you, you're going to learn yeah. that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so in the brain, every screen is, is organized the same exact way, and there's always only one item in the middle. It's the active thought. It's, it's one of the conceits of the brain but I really like the way the brain is organized because moment by moment, I'm not confused by the half million things that are in the big brain. I'm always looking at a screen full. I don't, and I don't care what the big ball of twine looks like. It's not interesting right. to me, right? Um, so I have thoughts about the design of this project and so forth that, that, that are you know, like thoughts in my brain and I go look there and I, and, I'm, and, I, and I try to pay attention there. Problem is I'm curious about everything and very easily distracted. In fact, yesterday, I put in a clip from the movie Up of uh, the moments in the movie Up where they go squirrel. I seen it. Remember squirrel? I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. You must see Up. It's actually uh, really, really fun. That's Jay. Good it's to see you. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 You're uh, muted, by the way. <laughs> yeah, SJ, we can't hear you yet, but it could be he's in a noisy place. Okay. Um, so so anyway so so this this notion of lo local structure um, I just copy I just sent you a link to my brain to potential yep. OGM architecture components which is where I put um, things like IPFS and solid and all those kinds of things because here's the grab bag of stuff I've, I've drifted across hey everybody's showing up that's awesome um, ¿Qué tal? Mm -hmm. ¿Qué tal? Hello. Good, uh, good Hi there. Come on. Yes. That's right. Um, and SJ just joined us. He's on mute. We're not sure that he can unmute uh, yet at this point. Uh, yeah. Matthew and I started at the top, top of the hour and have been having a great time. Hey, guys. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and, and I, I know what I was going to ask you, Matthew, which was hmm. um, the chapter that you posted on Medium. Yeah. How are you interested in how might you in, instrument that? And I think instrumentation is the wrong word here, but I don't know the better word. How might you... Uh, uh, add stuff to it to turn it into a, a, a shared object in the big fungus, in the shared memory. Meaning, uh, right now it's, it's sort of a blog post on a blogging platform called Media, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's interesting because it's in the public sphere, that's kind of cool, et cetera, et cetera. But how could, it, how could we, it, it be made more useful, more linkable, more weavable, et cetera, et cetera? Well, at the moment, because of Medium is a very simple, blocking platform and every year ev makes it simpler and simpler and takes away features until it's basically just going to be notepad right. um and just you know I, he does that you know, all the time he's just like i like some of the features that he's just taking them away and my blog post has to you know they refer to you know the video left no it's not left anymore it's just up or down you know it's really irritating anyway sorry oh, they took the away tangent. Tangent, right yeah I didn't know the that. images are in the middle and they're all the same size and that's it. That's all there is. You know, it's just Oh, like, that oh. sucker. Well, yeah. Um I clearly anyway, haven't written a, written a post on Medium in a while. You know, the thing is that it's a it's a full blog post and it belongs there, right? And it's got some tags which are 
relevant to the medium platform and that's all that's all what would and, and i think that's fine and that should continue i like finished products on you know published as blog as blog posts but what you can have a cloud in any piece of content you can have a cloud of content around it which is related to it right so for example if you were to read my blog post and you were to annotate my blog post into your note taking app whether it would be public or private that would be your takeaways your observations your ideas which have been provoked by what i wrote and that goes into into your system with your tags and your way of presenting it and your local structure and your local navigation and people do that you know people take notes on various note taking apps and they're all in these little silos everywhere what would be great would be that if those if those notes about the blog post could be part of a shareable soup along with the blog post itself so that when you go to the blog post you can see immediately here's what all these people are saying about this blog post or even about this paragraph of this blog post and that's a decentralized network of of notes so if for example you take notes about that blog post in your system and the system says oh 29 other people have also made notes about that and they may have made notes about it on in in the same um, note taking platform that, that you use or something completely different if they all use activity hub activity pub then that could be decentralized together so you will discover other people and the way they reacted to the blog post um, through this federation uh, essentially and that's how i think you weave content together because people put content out there other people react to it but at the moment, all those reactions are all in these silos and they're not connectable together in any real way. I mean, Bingo. people can people can comment on the Medium post on Medium right. and you can see that comment. Mm -hmm. You can discover that person, right? But it'd be much easier if I could just get yeah, on, as long as you've got a Medium account. But if you haven't got a Medium account, you can't publish a comment and you can't and do anything with it, really. Part of the so you shouldn't need an account to interact with content. You yeah. shouldn't need an well, account on that platform. Part of the problem is that Medium doesn't want to outsource the commenting to Hypothesis, for example, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. If, if that happened, if everybody was sort of commenting through Hypothesis, you'd have an account on Hypothesis, so you'd need that account. Hmm. But then you could string together all the different bibs and bits and bobs um, over there across platforms, which is pretty cool. Yeah. But you're, then you're yeah, just so tying... Plus on base, compatible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the thing is that you know, Hypothesis is just one other platform. Uh, it would be better if there was an open standard so any tool that used that standard could could interact with any piece of content yeah, and but there is. the I content mean, that they create could be readable by anyone using that standard. So you don't have exactly. to use hypothesis. You so, could use so MyHub, you could use Mastodon, you could use whatever. You know? But we do have that. Uh, I mean, we're, the word standard, as understand it, should be that. And that's what Hypothesis and Memex implement. But I asked Dan Whaley and Oliver from MX, uh, why don't you interrupt? And they were like, yeah, we're cool because we're using the same standard, but we don't. Mm -hmm. But but that does seem like a very like potentially low hanging fruit. Yeah. Like uh, like development. Mm -hmm. Just like get get it, you know, these particular two implementations of the standard to interrupt. Well, at the uh, top at the top of the call, Matthew mentioned um, Activity Pub and the Fediverse project, which are, I think, attempts to do some of this. Yes. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. I mean, the Fediverse is the universe of apps which use the Activity Pub, you know, uh, standard, which is a W3C standard. So, yeah. um, <clears throat> but I mean, I'm not technical enough to actually, you know, dive into it. I don't even have a Fediverse account yet. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit sort of, I'm a bit sort of blocked by knowing I don't know which which server I should I should use. Should I set up my own? And I so I so haven't I'm... gotten to it yet. I'm really interested in the simplest thing we could possibly do to stand up a working example of this. So if we can help each other do the tools and, and connect the bits uh, so that we can begin collaborating with shared notes and comments mm. in, the, in the Fediverse, for example, I'm in, yeah. like, like count me in. I wanna, I wanna do that soon because I want to start riffing on how does this feel? What does it look like? What are the platforms that make it work? Let's just like yeah. let's just like get practical yeah. and get out there. Completely. Completely. Well, why don't we set up a Mastodon server or something? 
Oh, good. So Another tool. I mean, we could, yes. um, so we, we do so have, we do have <laughs> well, the Mastodon is the, is the Twitter lookalike on, on in the face. I know. We do, we do have the Mattermost channel uh, active already. So that's a very good place. I'm sorry, to I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. And I'd be perfectly, perfectly happy to run this conversation there. And also, uh, Flancian, if you want to put links to the doc in that channel, then people can follow our notes. And also, I meant to ask you, did you save the recording from the previous call, did you post it any place on YouTube or something? Hmm, interesting. Uh, I th I think it's saved uh, to my, my Dropbox, but I didn't. <clears throat> yeah, well, this one when I when I when I hit record on this call, it made me log into my Dropbox account, which I don't use yeah. very much. But yeah. uh, I will take it from Dropbox and I'll post it on YouTube yes. and I'll post that to the to the uh, Mattermost channel so that we know where it is and I'll add that to nice. my brain around this call. Yeah, where, is um, where, did, where is the Matty most the Metamost channel? In fact? I will. Uh, oh, it's in uh, the hedge doc, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Uh, it should be. Uh, if not, it's in the at least in the agora. I think uh, I'll, I'll, I may have failed, but it should be in the fellowship. I've got it right here. The link. Uh, yeah. I've, I've of course got a, a link in my brain. There we go. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. Uh, yes, and on, on setting up uh, these tools um, and the Amazon server and so on, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that, uh, uh, with uh, experimenting there. Um, I'm, I am happy to uh, get started if you want. I have a spare server like with containers, and it shouldn't be too hard. Uh, I also run an instance already. Uh, I mean, run, I think. Like, I, I am an admin in Social Coop, which yeah. I don't know if you all no social cop. It is pretty much an experiment in the same space, so I think it's related to what we're discussing. <clears throat> um, right now, it's we only run the Mastodon instance for the community. It has about two thousand users, mm -hmm. okay. uh, and it could be a, at least a friendly project in the space, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like a, and a good source of interesting people. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, but that, but for an experiment, I think it, it does make sense to perhaps set up like a, a special ad hoc instance. And try to make things play well to each other, essentially. Cool. Uh, <clears throat> okay, that sounds good fun. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Yes, and uh, thank you for your chapter, uh, uh, Matthew. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, good luck. It's 18 minutes long. It's just the introduction to the chapter. Oh, interesting. Well, you know, it's I've got two months to to, to write the full <laughs> chapter, so it's just yeah. a brain it's just a brain dump which I wanted to I had to get done before because I'm leaving on Sunday for a ten day yeah. trek, so I needed to get this out of my system. Otherwise, I would well spend done. the entire trek just thinking, you know, thinking it through. So a lot of the a lot of that, you know, eight, eighteen minute read is going to probably be transferred to subsequent parts of the chapter. I nice. just wanted to get everything I had from I had various documents and yeah. <clears throat> you know I uh, wanted to put it all into one place and get a few diagrams out there. And I'm really interested in deconstructing. So I'm on a similar path, but I haven't written the essay you're writing. But for me, there's like a bunch of nuggets that assemble into an essay where some of the nuggets won't make it into the essay, but they still yeah. like deserve being published someplace. Yes, exactly. Uh, so in the video that I posted, I was like, hey, a book is just a, a playlist of nuggets. I, I um, just love that video. You know, you've seen the notes I talk about it. I, I yeah. paid a lot of attention. You know? <laughs> thank you. And, and, and really, thank you very much for doing that. That's, that's tremendous. Um, and so I'm very interested in how to deconstruct your intro and chapter so that at the end, Ibor gets exactly what he wants for the intro and chapter, but every idea you had still exists in a lovely little nugget form in a shareable version in the big fungus somewhere, which is well, the then, thing is that they, there are like, yeah, sorry, which, go ahead. I'm which is then weavable and connectable by you and by others. Sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, um, the, the introduction introduces like five or six different concepts, which are all part of the big picture. Yep. And the idea is that each of these concepts gets uh, a whole sub chapter later on and the introduction gives you the whole, the big picture. Um, so if you think about each subsection of the introduction is like the, the executive summary of the chapter, right? So that's a nugget and it's linked to a slightly larger collection of nuggets. So like an executive summary of a set of nuggets. So you can deconstruct the entire chapter into um, one set of nuggets, which are executive summaries of each of them, a whole set of other nuggets. But So like a tree, mm -hmm. but with lots of cross links. 
because you know I, I'd have to do a diagram. There's no way of explaining this verbally, but I, you're nodding, so I guess you you know I what I, you know I, what I, I mean. Mostly, and that would be yeah, that would be fun lot. to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. That that would be that would be pretty cool to do. And SJ has a challenge for us. Yeah, go for it. Okay, oh. take a commons that you care about or that you're building. Yeah, and scope out its potential full extent. So I have so, a I have a suggestion for this project. Yeah, great. Okay. Um, on my list of wish list of, of things to do in this whole general vein is to take one of the pattern languages that exist, like either uh, liberating structures or uh, the pedagogy pattern language or wise democracy pattern language. Those are three that I know of that are well developed, mm -hmm. that are open source, that are brilliant, where the communities I'm connected to and actually turn them into uh, commons, shared materials, and then further, again, this word instrument. Somebody needs to train me with a better word than this. But the example I gave, I might have even done this on one of our conversations here, like Liberating Structures has a pattern called one, two, four, all that says, hey, when you have a thorny uh, question with a big group, it's it's really fruitful to set, give them each time by themselves, pair them up, bring them in the fours, and then bring everybody back to plenary. It's just one, two, four, all. It's just a pattern. This could easily be a zap in Zoom. This could easily be a little Zoom applet that says, hey, I notice you've got a, 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 you know, there could be an intelligent chatbot that's helping you do facilitation that says, you might want to use one, two, four, all right now. Would you like me to do it? And then you press a yes button and it does all the breakout room coordinating prompts, uh, prompt setting into the chat, uh, dividing people up into the breakouts, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff is handled automatically because mm -hmm. it's just code, right? So, so all of that I can easily envision. I haven't started doing any of it or approached the community, but that would make a very, very nice prototype project if anybody else likes it. That sounds very nice, yes. I mean, I, in general, like the idea of like, having uh, chatbots that uh, assist in discussion and like, push towards like coordination, high coordination uh, states, uh, cooperation and so on. Uh, sounds very interesting. Uh, for problem solving, I, 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 something related, I, I thought of it's like you know something that uh, realizes when you are going you you, you are considering the, a why and leads you into like five whys right <laughs> for example uh, like perhaps in parallel also in breakout rooms you know you could like a, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I I imagined a while ago a, a chatbot which. The most irritating chatbot in the world. It's called Five Wise, <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it's really irritating. But you 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 know that it's going to help you at the end of the day if you just keep answering it, and it'll get there. Right, yeah. right. It could be a really super simple chatbot, almost yeah, yeah. like um, Elisa, you know, back in the, in the completely 70s. yes, <laughs> a rubber duck that just is why. Uh, <laughs> so um, it's, uh, to, to f follow up on your idea, Jerry, what would the full extent of the resulting commons be, and what would its what would its impact, what would its second order? So um, for me, part of the motivation is that there's a lot of wisdom, distilled wisdom, which is what I think of as uh, pattern languages being. Pattern, pattern languages are distilled wisdom that's just trapped in little websites nobody's ever heard of and trapped in books that are protected by DRM, et cetera, et cetera. So liberating, liberating structures and things like it, and then instrumenting them so that they're really useful and usable and then creating some means that'll propagate, hey, everybody, you should plug this thing in, it's available, um, would then hopefully upgrade the quality of, of group conversations because the facilitation would get better. Because, because you know, one, two, four, all is just one of lots of different patterns in these three pattern languages that I'm already thinking about. And there's a bunch of, and I know people who are dying to create other pattern languages. So mm -hmm. how do we create a better platform for pattern languages, a brief digression here. In Free Jerry's Brain on Mondays, very early in the lockdown, um, we decided to try to build a platform for pattern languages. So Marc-Antoine Perron spent some time taking Semantic Media Wiki and instrumenting it to create a pattern language. And we tested it out on the first day of testing, we realized that when you change the name of a pattern, Semantic Media Wiki sucked at being flexible on the name of the pattern. It just, it just we, we realized it would be a nightmare to try to propagate the changes or make sure that it was consistent. So we kind of stopped right there because the tool wasn't amenable to, to figuring that out. And maybe like a backlink rich uh, system that knows that it's just a link and whatever you call it, I don't care. Maybe that's the mm -hmm. way to go. Um, but, but we could also then prototype a place for people to write pattern languages 
um, and, and we happen to be using a finished one because look, here's the cake and what it's going to look like when you're done, but then inspire other people to build public facing pattern languages that are instrumentable. You definitely need a better word. Yeah, yeah. Instru what's instrumentable. I don't know what's because um, what's, what's this I like instrumentalize. Uh... I mean, so, <laughs> right. It, I think it's a, it's a term of art to say instrument X to give it yeah. importance Y. Normally, my understanding now is instrumenting software means you're dropping ta uh, sort of uh, stop points and labels and tags or some other markers into the code so that you can then see where it broke and what's going on. That's that's right. that's what instrumenting means. In also, software. reality and the reality. Yes. Yes. So that, that's the assumption I know because yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to take a completely different tack on it. I'm trying to say, how do I enact, reify, enable? Uh, I, I don't yeah. know what the word is. How do I take an idea that's just an idea and make it software that's usable, for example? Yes. How, essentially, it, it seems to be like, how do you develop an instrument out of, the, uh, out of, out of something uh, less uh, pragmatically oriented or like less available, right? So these, these yes. pattern languages, they're a theoretical, a theoretical way, a, a theoretical approach to doing something. And you want to you turn it into a, a tool which helps yes. you do that, helps you do that thing, right? Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, instrumentalizing so, oh, is the best you're going to get, actually. Uh, it's not a yeah. good word, but I think because it's Because it's right instrument one. and there's instrumentalize. I think instrumentalize is this? I instrumentalize right? is literally, literally gives you what you want, but it's not very poetic. Uh, yeah, it's not very poetic. It's one, of, one of the patterns, so I, I like that you settled on this early on, Gary, because uh, a long time ago, I also, somewhere, I, I will track it down, I had a... Um, like after after my first attempt to build tools for communities uh, designing their own their own sites, I also tried to define what a platform for pattern languaging would be. Oh, and uh, we wanted to help people do the thing. And um, my friends and I even reached out to uh, you know the pattern language authors at, at the time they were all still alive and wanted to see if they were interested mm -hmm. because you know the, the the various books that six, that uh, six, came after Alexander's pattern language, they got kind of weird, but they were all different kinds of patterns, right? Yeah. And he got the religion, and he kind of wanted to patternize religion, but um, they kept changing their framework, and so the frameworks of the books are very different. From anyway, uh, we had this idea that we could somehow get uh, Alexander and Ward and a couple other people to agree on a platform and use it in very different ways, but it was uh -huh. hard. It was hard. Uh, yeah. You're talking I think about it's a lot really, easier really now, strong, and I think it's really a lot easier with young people who are just playing around than with people who have like made a mark and then they're kind of fond of what the thing they did. They don't want to try something. Part of the problem with Engelbart in, in, in his life was that he couldn't see any other way to instantiate this thing he had invented. Yeah. Like Eugene Eric Kim spent a decade trying to help Doug re, re, rebuild the original MLS, or no, uh, NLS, I guess, um, on, an, on new platforms, which was not what was needed anymore. Right, right, right. Uh, uh, so, so love this. Uh, so, so do you like the scenario, SJ? So, I, I, yes, I love the scenario, and um, you have helped me clarify my challenge for you all. Good. I, so I what what like do you mean by much. scope out its potential uh, to yes. second degree yes. impact? Could you please unpack that a bit? I'm sure that the rest of the other people in this group know exactly what you're talking about. No, no, don't make I don't mind displaying my ignorance. So, go, please. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what I what I initially meant, and what I would and what I what I would like the challenge to be this week, although we can come back to those other things, is to do this for a global commons, and to think about the global impact of the commons. So in that sense, if you start with building a platform for pattern languages for my friends who love pattern languages, the first group are the people who have all these small websites, and they realize not a lot of people use it. If you think about the global commons around it, it is something like the societal change that is possible when you identify and transmit these memes. And um, the scoping piece of this is uh, think about versions of this that have come before and tried and failed. Think about versions that are like this that inspired it. Think about groups you'd want to partner or integrate with. And then after you've thought about that, reflect on what the broadest possible scope could be if this, if this were simply embedded in everything else. If this existed and it were an understood commons and it didn't need to be named as something that we're constructing, what would its extent be? Um, what would its scope as part of human behavior be? And that's what I was trying to um, 
say when I played out the scenario with the pattern languages in terms of this is not a fancy thing to, to uh, make pattern language uh, fans happy. This was a, is actually a strategy to make anybody facilitating conversations a better facilitator. And that's the global commons second order impact is that it ripples back into, oh my gosh, I've got better skills and they're right at hand and look, I should be using these. And suddenly the level of conversation goes up. Similarly, um, if they start using the artifacts and feeding the fungus, then we start building a global shared memory artifact, which is a second order uh, uh, benefit as well that could come out of the same project. Sorry, Flancian, you, you even have your, your, your hands. It's fine. No, no, it's fine. Let's, let's continue. Because, you know, this is I'm taking notes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, definitely. So do you want to, um, do you want to, invi oh, sorry, Fletcher, you're going to speak next. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, it's fine, fine. No, but in terms of scoping out, what, what, does, what is the end product what, uh, of this scoping exercise? Is it a, an, an envisioning something? Is it a document? Is it, you know, what, what, what is it? I, I'm a little bit, I'm being a little bit too concrete perhaps, but because when you use the word scope, it could mean a thousand different things in a thousand different contexts to a thousand different people. So what do you have in mind at the end of the, of the exercise? Who, you know, how do you judge that the challenge has been met? I'd like to, I would like talking to many people about it to add to some very crude universal measures of scope, but a couple measures that would be good for provocation are things like, um, proportion of total human or societal uh, in interaction or outputs or footprints affected in a given year. So for some things, let's say, and, and and depending on what you're talking about, it may really only make sense in a very cleanly defined dimension. So if you're talking about mm -hmm. a commons around energy and you want to talk about um, how some particular commons would change the dynamics of energy, that's that's pretty computable. Right. We, we know what the total insulation of the planet is. We know what a bunch of energy sources sort of that could be converted within the planet are. And uh, and that's it. We actually have a fixed energy envelope for all sources and all things. And if yeah. you're building a commons that uh, that allows for some portion of reflected insulation to come into the ecosystem, then you can very literally talk about that kind of impact. Um, mm. That's it. I'm yeah. There, so there are some, uh, to use the other uh, version of instrumented, there are some very cleanly instrumented dimensions where one can do this particularly well. Then there are others where you want to influence um, policy or thought, or you want to influence education, and that's tricky. And there are some where um, you might want to empower people or speed certain things up. And then what are you that's doing? It's yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what, oh, this is what Jerry was talking about. If you instrumentalize um, pattern language, you're not making a tool which people who know what pattern languages are are going to like. But you can, that'd be nice, but you're not going to have a great impact unless you actually make a tool with people who've never heard of pattern languages say, oh, shit, this is good. Yeah, this is cool. Oh, it's based on something called a pattern language. Well, I don't have time to worry about that. I'm just going to use it, right? Bingo. What what is this? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Long. So, uh, during is that applause? Uh, yes, uh, from sign language, this means applause. Uh, jazz okay, hands up. Good. This this means I disagree. Uh, it, so okay. I, I I've been using this all through lockdown because uh, it 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 helps comment back without interrupting. And yeah, yeah, it. yeah. I've got to I've got to start doing that because if you've probably noticed, I interrupt way too much, <laughs> and, I, and I know it. So jazz hands and what's this, this, this? This means I disagree. This means I'm kind of I'm kind of meh. Yeah, I don't really like. Yeah. I don't really like. Gonna, that. Well, I do that. I do that occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also saw that for the first time with you, Jerry, and I, I, I just love it. It's great, and, and it, it actually, lot, yeah. I, I I learned about it through the Occupy movement because with Occupy they were doing the mic check stuff. And they also had some hand signs. This means blocking. I, I don't agree with this. I'm going to leave if this if this goes through. There, you know, this means louder. Speak louder. <clears throat> um, so there were a bunch of hand signs for occupied that they borrowed from things like sign language. 
Okay. Um, and now I teach this everywhere. In fact, years ago, I taught this. I gave a speech in front of a bunch of military people, 50, 50 officers in a facility in San Antonio, Texas, all in camos with, with medals. And there was a colonel who was doing jazz hands in the middle of the session. And I'm like, yes, we have won. If a, if a, <laughs> if a, if a colonel is doing jazz hands and laughing and everybody else gets it and likes it, we're good. Yeah, it's really great because I mentioned if you if you look over a crowd and you've got you can count pretty easily how many jazz hands there are and how many like this without so, without necessarily being in you know having a verbal conflict about it, right? So the occupy hand signs, not phrased as such, because half the people on the planet hate occupy and think it's a terrible uh, anarchist uprising. So so feedback mechanisms for group process are part of a pattern language or should be. So mm -hmm. this this thing we just talked about, jazz hands ought to be available to people facilitating Zoom rooms and it's, say, hey, would you like some tips? And, and there could be a simple, intelligent chatbot assistant that says, I'm here to help you make better Zooms. Tell me, tell me what you're trying to get done. I will learn about you. And then using a transformer tool, it could get frickin' smart. It can then understand what the pattern languages are and suggest the right ones at the right time. And you could just go to town with this. Yes, yeah. completely. Um, are you familiar with uh, Free, Fair, and Alive? I think we discussed it. It sounds perhaps. familiar. Yeah, so uh, it is framed as a pattern language for the commons mm -hmm. and for like distributed governance. And they they uh, they did study uh, Occupy and other like you know. Uh, Silke Hefrick and David Bollier, yes, the yes, books. exactly, yes, exactly. Uh, so it reminded me of that because they, they uh, at least they they set up to do this. I haven't finished yet, but uh, it doesn't include uh, exactly a pattern language uh, in the second half. Uh, so I think it's a, I, I, I've been meaning to organize um, a reading club uh, on this <clears throat> and, and others. We could do a meta. So, so um, there is a reading club happening inside of OGM around nice. Dawn of Everything, right? Which is a really interesting mm -hmm. book. And I had to drop out because I had other things going on and I just couldn't catch up with reading the, the things. But how do we metabolize knowledge together so that yes. it's more usable and instrumented as much as possible? Yes. Right. That that's. I think reading clubs are great, and then mostly the people who participate in the reading club, twenty percent of them understood the book. The others couldn't keep up, and then everybody stops that book and goes to the next one. And all of the artifacts of that conversation basically exist only in the heads of twenty percent of the participants. Yes. How do we metabolize all this stuff, fruit it into the world, instrument yes. it into the world, in 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 tasty fungus bits that let mm. us all improve what we do? I, I mean, I, I have an answer to that, but it's 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 obvious, which is uh, uh, and, and idiosyncratic. It is with an agora, but yes. like uh, <laughs> right. But it, so the no club uh, organized by Neil in the agora is meant to be a take on this, which is like will be like a loosely coupled reading club and writing club. Right. And the writing part is important, right? Because that that's precisely how you know you, we default to interacting via the notes. So by definition, uh, we sort of like are producing uh, perhaps like uh, more artifacts that can then be read and picked up, you know, of course, like how the, all the benefits of writing. Uh, but yes, very interesting. I guess um, I wanted to take up on like uh, perhaps uh, some potential dimensions to explore uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Samuel's uh, question uh, on your know, metrics perhaps or uh, uh, and scoping. Uh, but I don't know if you wanted to close on previously uh, pattern language in general or uh, any other things we could touch on. Okay, I'll go. Oh, yeah, Matthew, go ahead. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I, I put a couple of, but once I got a hang about what Samuel was was looking for, uh, I just put a couple of ideas into into chat as well. I don't know if they fit under the heading of, of pattern languages, but one of the things which I think would have a really big impact is um, an instrument, uh, a tool or technique, or some sort of software or whatever that could just help two people have better conversations when they don't necessarily agree with each other. Yes. Um, that would just change the world. You know, if, if people were taught that, you know, okay, we're going to have this sort of conversation and there's like a sign, like not, not this, like this, but let's have, let's not have this. Let's, I don't know, have that or something, some other sign. Like, I'm not going to try to tell you that you're wrong and that I'm right. We're going to have a different sort of conversation. Um, and there's, there's a, 
a shed load of literature and knowledge about how people can have better conversations. And no one knows any of it. And even the people who know it don't even use it because you just keep on getting trapped in in the you know the the patterns of the, of the of the animal brain right and you don't end up having conversations which is good which are as good as you could have um i'm trying to lower my hand now i'm not succeeding <laughs> <laughs> uh, nice. raise lower yeah whatever consider my hand down so that was one idea techniques for having better conversations and the other one was just as as you were saying jerry about how um, people having a book reading club and they have a conversation about the book and then they move on to something else. And all that knowledge is, okay, the people who are in the room at the time come away with some of it. But if you weren't in the room at the time, it's gone. That's every conference and workshop you've ever been to, that's even every, the ones which have been recorded. That's it's every, terrible. Every, that's every mailing list wrong. People saying brilliant things on private mailing lists that go into the bit bucket. Yeah, the hell out of me. It's yeah. So, so, so to me, this this just like leads me to think that one high leverage uh, action here is like a, anything that reduces the friction uh, for going be, uh, from like the personal and the, and this goes very much in the direction of the of the book, right? And so on is like going from personal contributions to social contributions. Like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, um, I don't know why my hand went down. I didn't take it down. I just wanted to interject two things. Yeah. I have to leave at the quarter after, so I, I'm yes. I'm here for a few more minutes. Um, and then a small thing, we were trying to figure out how to have a really big effect on the world. And I was like, we need to hack um, pastors.com because Rick Warren of the Saddleback Megachurch runs a website called pastors.com where tons of evangelical preachers get their sermons. Now, oh, I'm, God, how awful. I, now, I don't think Rick Warren has gone to the dark side, but <laughs> the, the, the idea here is if you could change what evangelical preachers are saying on Sundays in the United States only, uh, you could change the world. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. because the evangelical far right is on fire about a bunch of issues that are being lit on purpose to distract us from the world's problems. Mm -hmm. wow. Just my opinion. But 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 hacking the server <laughs> where they buy their sermons is they is buy a, them. It's a business. It's a business. You're not. Wow. You're going to write a great new essay every Sunday. <laughs> well, I mean, I couldn't know. you just couldn't you just post you know low cost, really well written there are sermons yeah, you could. that are not that are not necessarily fire and brimstone. There's and, no business model there. Yeah, yeah. No, but no, interpastors.com. You know, create you know, an account. I'm, I'm saying you if you hack your way in and post like you know, good be good to each other and actual be, be actual Christians. You could maybe hack the whole thing, but the problem is that many of the the fiery creatures have gone completely off the deep end. Yeah, anyway, yeah, sorry yeah, to distract. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's not a distraction. That would be a really major impact on the world, and you could probably measure it if you knew how many people actually bought your your sermon and how many people they preach to. You could probably get quite good metrics out of that. So, uh, as a fun idea, yeah, it would be fun. Free, uh, free, <laughs> free sermons .org, um, could be a website that where, where we motivate people who are really good writers of sermons to write sermons that are good for humanity right. and where the, the, the landing page basically says, hey, one of our big problems is that a bunch of people are preaching non-Christian things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you get a bunch of ex-evangelicals. I don't know if you've heard the term ex-evangelicals. <laughs> um, follow Chrissy Stroop on Twitter. She's really good. <clears throat> There's a bunch of others. But it's people who've left evangelical fanaticism uh, right, and are busy okay. saying, hey, uh, she wrote a book called Empty the Pews, which is really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so, so that's uh, interesting. If you're, looking, if you're looking for cultural leverage, uh, yeah, Sermon Central, and then post open source sermons and let people riff on them and let people remix them and build them as nuggets, right? Uh, let them build playlists of the sermons that they want to do using this infrastructure and we're off to the races. Right, However, it, uh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I would say that rather than build a separate website, which you're going to struggle to get, I think the original idea, when you said hack, I thought you actually meant like really hack it and take it down. But instead, I, it would I, be better to actually just go in there as pastors. That's, that's what but I you'd mean. You'd have to set up, you'd have to set up some sort of shadow <laughs> network of people who want to do this. Yes, and they course. would all go in and all like each other's work and recommend it and, and set up a a shadow community in there just to try to shift the Overton window a bit back towards the civilized world, you know? So you've understood my, my intention properly, which is not to take down the site, but to Oops. corrupt the site with goodness. Um, <laughs> the, 
or, or Sermon Central, which I'm going to add to my brain now. But the alternative here is to be above board and post a new website with an interesting yes. name, like, like humanistsermons.org, right? right? Uh -huh. Communists. That, that, is, that, is completely open, <laughs> that is completely open source and, re, and modifiable and, and, and loves and uses a fork and pull, um, uses GitHub as the under, exactly. uh, underpinnings so that people can actually improve one another's sermons, blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? Yes, and, and, and I think that uh, there's a lot of like uh, uh, fixed costs in running uh, such a site or such a project. But if you take a step back and uh, see it as, you know, from the pattern level, the, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, sites that, you know, that we have that ideally will be part of the knowledge commons, but aren't, right? Uh, the, the alternatives we could develop to actually That's replace cool. them or complement them or like, you know, subvert them, they, they, they look sort of the same. It's essentially, and this is where, you know, concepts like, uh, you know, like Samuel's, like the, the interlay, uh, the underlay program and so on, uh, right? And, and, you know, like ideally, you know, like it's, it's also something we want to talk about the Agora, is like provide the core, the, you know, the skeleton for any such site, ideally, uh, in a way that is more flexible, than you know like perhaps uh, like just the currently yeah. current weeks we have which only also uh, as far over they're pretty good uh but uh, again like like you said like you know, git base and so on and 